Well, good morning, everybody. Hey. Um, you all look in better shape than I thought you would. Of course, I need new glasses, so that might be an explanation of, of, of whatever. Um, I am, again, so thrilled to be able to kick off day, day two. We have um, the best fire person, I think, I've ever run across in my entire life who's going to tell us stuff that is not going to be obvious and is going to be important. We need to change the way we build. Um, Jeff is, um, he's done everything in the fire community. He's um, been a hot shot. He's been a fire chief. Um, he actually knows the physics of, of fires. And, and, and so uh, I think, you know, light my fire, he wrote that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying. They're just not getting the, the joke. That was, that was funny. That was funny. So please, you know, light a fire under us today, Jeff. It's, it's, an, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's an honor to be here, Joe and Betsy. What a, what a class act, and I appreciate your passion for what you do. I've never met a more passionate group of people uh, before, and I've learned so much over the past few days. Doc, you scared the daylights out of me yesterday with microbes and coming at me with a scalpel in Borneo. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd rather go in a burning building, okay? <laughs> So I am staying out of the Papua New Guinea or wherever. <laughs> Uh, but it's kind of fun to return to my old stomping grounds. I went to college here in Mass uh, back in the late 70s, and uh, the traffic in Boston was a mess then, and I got reintroduced to trying to get out of Logan Airport with the tunnel closed and two, three car wrecks, and an hour and a half later with my phone sending me up to Revere, uh, we, we got here. Revere. <laughs> Revere. Revere. I got to get my accent back. I grew up in Vermont, so it, it'll come back. I'll say, sure, okay? We go around the corner, right? You guys understand. <laughs> uh, but we're going to have some fun today. Uh, I did want to give Joe a hard time, you know, being a fire uh, and somewhat a fire code person. I looked at the occupant load near the bar in his place last night. <laughs> I didn't see an exit sign, Joe. The door swings the wrong way, but the booze was good. <laughs> so what could go wrong there? <laughs> So, hey, I am going to take you on a journey today, and we're going to not go straight building science. You're the experts on buildings, okay? I do fires. So we're going to deviate a little bit and get into the fascinating area, the forensics behind wildfires, the wildfire investigations, and obviously circle around the community planning and then some structural hardening issues. Uh, if you want to get into the nuts and bolts of construction, I'm not going to do that. You, you folks are the experts. Joe wrote a good paper. Go to his webpage. I think, uh, where are you, Joe? F uh, February uh, of this year. And, uh, I, I, see, I, I, I nosed around. I tracked you down. And he wrote a very good paper on some construction techniques and protection, particularly on roof assemblies, which was uh, fascinating. So I'm going to stay in my wheelhouse, but we're going to go on a fun journey today. So with that, I think I got my clicker organized. Uh, the book says we're supposed to learn something. All right, we will. We'll talk about the science and the forensics behind wildfires, particularly investigations. We'll get into the community planning aspects, some of the political implications of uh, wildfires and community planning, and as well as some of the applicable codes and some, uh, some things on structural hardening. Because I'm going to tell you, I fought hundreds, if not thousands, of wildfires. I've investigated hundreds of wildfires. And I have seen, literally, as sad as it is, hundreds and hundreds of homes burn right before my eyes. And I'll give you some real life stories of where the failure occurred in the homes that have burned. And I got some great videos too. So no death by PowerPoint this morning, okay? I like that. <laughs> Putting the P 
pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, sometimes I watch those uh, fire or crime scenes on TV. You guys ever watch the CSI stuff? And I go nuts, because they solve everything in 50 minutes. They find an eyebrow hair up there, or solve the fire in, in 45 minutes, and I am dropping F-bombs at the TV. So uh, the puzzle gets complicated. It really does. These things don't get solved. The media wants to know the answers right away. I testify in court an awful lot. Well, how, it, how come it took you two weeks? How come you didn't know? Uh, but these things do take time, and uh, we have to look at the science behind things, which is what fascinates me. A little bit of trivia here. This is the original Smokey Bear. All right, there you go. There's Smokey. And here's more trivia. Smokey has his own zip code. There you go. Take that home with you. Smokey has a zip code if you want to send Smokey a letter. Uh, but Smokey got its name from uh, the big fires back in the early 1900s. I think it was uh, uh, during the big burn era. And Smokey burned a paw and they saved Smokey. And that whole campaign got going. And, uh, and I think a lot of good has come of it. So there you go. Real life Smokey for you. Now, let's talk about what's going on with wildfires. I, you all read the news, okay? The wildfire season is not July and August anymore in the U.S., Canada, across many parts of the world. It is all year long. And I'm not getting going to get into the politics of climate warming, but there is change occurring. I think we can all agree on that for whatever cause. Right now, the western U.S. is having some major issues. You know, I, I'm a nerd. I'm, an, I'm a geek on this, okay? So I'm on my phone and I'm just looking at wildfires all over the country. Got one yesterday. A squirrel got electrocuted on some power lines in Colorado. The squirrel got fried, but the squirrel's on fire. A squirrel fell to the ground, started a fire. So can we sue the squirrel for the fire? I don't think, <laughs> I don't think so. But long, you know, bottom line is wildfire season is longer than it ever has been. It's more severe. For me, when I grew up fighting these things and living in the woods for a couple weeks, a 20,000 acre fire was huge. Now I'll put a zero after 20,000, and we're getting close to the mega fires that we're seeing now. So things are changing, and things are drying out. Canada's having fires. This year, Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, Greece are burning. So no part of the world, Australia, New Zealand, in their summer months. Uh, so no part of the world is immune to this anymore, and it's, it's starting to get a, a scary. It really is. The impacts to our economy, uh, whatever, wherever you're from, whatever state, whatever country you're from, the impacts are unbelievable. Uh, fires cost, to put these things out and put it in perspective, the big fires, they're running over a million dollars a day to just for suppression. Each airplane load, a drop in slurry, thirty to fifty thousand dollars. Helicopters, eighteen hundred dollars an hour. Uh, it gets incredibly expensive. Uh, so, you know, it's hurting our economy a little bit. The estimates are 70 to 90 billion dollars a year. That's B with a B, a billion with a big B on it. Look at some of the impacts besides lost timber. All right, Western U.S., particularly agriculture. What is it? Everyone sees cows out there in the middle of Kansas, but what are they? Those are dollar bill signs walking around with four legs. Cows are expensive. Burnt cows are not worth anything. So agriculture loss is huge. Water rights, water impacts, water sheds, uh, timber loss. Uh, trees are worth money. They're green. We love them. But we all like paper products, you know, especially when I go to the bathroom. I like paper products. It's not good when it burns. So the, the impacts to all of us are unbelievable. And there is approximately, you know, like the, I'm not going to read the PowerPoint here, but 50 to 70,000 reported wildfires a year just in the U.S. Canada has a significant amount also. And these are just ones that are reported and get in the database uh, by its uh, organization called NIFSI out of uh, Boise that tracks this stuff. 
What are the obstructions in this whole process? You know, I, I, I don't want to do too many war stories, but I was in the middle of Kansas. I was lost. I mean, this was Kansas. I was lost, and I'm driving in my little Toyota Tacoma pickup truck, phone, no cell service, the GPS didn't work, and I had an obstruction here in the road, and I let the obstruction stay there, put it in four-wheel drive, and gave this critter a, a, a wide berth. But some of the big obstructions I see are time, 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 and money. All right? It's not cheap to go out and investigate these things and take a couple weeks with a whole team, hands and knees, getting down to the nitty gritty, and then determining cause and what uh, I get hired by insurance companies and attorneys because they want to sue each other because the, the insurance companies no longer want to write a check for $50 million when they lose a subdivision. They want to find someone to blame. Who started the fire? So they'll hire, you know, geeks like me to find out, you know, where it started, and then they'll try to subrogate and get some funds back from whoever caused that fire. So those are some of the obstructions we have to deal with: time, money, and politics play a role. We'll get into it. I bet you you didn't know this, but 85% of wildfires are human caused. All right? Some books are saying seven to eight, some are saying seven, 75 to 85 percent, it doesn't matter. So we think of human cause, everybody thinks it's little Billy running around flicking a bick. No, there's any number of things that cause wildfires. Obviously natural causes are lightning and some people put uh, natural causes like the volcanoes in Hawaii start wildfires, but it's kind of hard to sue God. But on this stuff, uh, here someone is at fault, humans do stuff stupid things. Uh, you know, some of the big ones we're seeing right here, and we'll get into details, equipment failure, diesels will spit off carbon chunks and start fires, uh, chains dragging along the highway will start fires, uh, fireworks, bottle rockets, I love them. You know, as a kid, we'd shoot that stuff all over, and I can't believe I didn't burn down the neighborhood, that's why I'm a firefighter. Uh, <laughs> juveniles, none of you played with matches when you were kids, right? Everybody say yes, come on, yeah, I didn't know me, I never played with with matches, but kids can get in trouble every now and then. Utility companies, you know, I work for and against some of them, and utility companies do have issues. There's a couple that won't send me Christmas cards anymore because I've cost them a lot of money. <laughs> Unattended campfires, I had a case where the Boy Scouts messed up and they didn't extinguish a campfire in the Bridger Teton area in Wyoming and burnt down X number of thousand acres, and it was so hard to go after the Boy Scouts. I felt because I was a Boy Scout until I got kicked out. They, they caught me drinking. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, stupidity. Do people do stupid things? You bet. I'm here. And there are some arsonists out there, and I've enjoyed putting some of them, giving them some government housing with nice windows that have crossbars. That's so much fun saying bye bye. See you in a couple years. Uh, so, we'll get into some of the detail here. It's part of our journey. Now, a term I think a lot of you have heard that is the interface zone, the wooey zone, uh, intermix zone. You know, pick whatever word you want, but cities and suburbia are expanding across North America, yes? And people, everyone wants to go live in the woods and have trees in the backyards and the nice white picket fence, you know, like at Joe's house. Uh, everyone wants that. That's the ideal dream for a lot of us. Uh, so homes are getting built further and further into uh, outside of the cities, into the uh, more a rural area, and therein lies the problem. We no longer have a little cabin out in the middle of the woods that's going to, our big worry, about catching on fire. We are now burning down subdivisions. We are burning down cities and towns next to big metropolis areas. So why do some homes, we'll talk about this here as we go on part of our journey this morning, why are some of these homes surviving and why are some not? This is from the Waldo Canyon fire outside of Colorado Springs. Second largest fire department in Colorado. Hundreds of firefighters, hydrants every 600 feet, big streets, good access, and yet the Mountain Shadows subdivision is gone. 
I was flying over this with a helicopter and I'm looking at some of the, the patterns and where this fire started. And why are some homes there and some are not? And what blows me away, if you look at the picture of some of the burned homes, there, there's homes, but there's green trees right next to it. So the trees didn't burn. What was the fuel? It was the homes. We're going to get to that in a little bit. The homes are the fuel. Everyone's worried about cutting down the blue spruce and all that. And yes, they cause problems. But the combustibility of the homes is creating its whole new era for us in trying to extinguish these things. All right, here, this is going to be on the test. Joe didn't tell you there is a test at the end, okay? I took it, I got a D on it, but it's all right. So, <laughs> you know, so how do wildfires spread? Number one, by wind. Wind, wind, wind. Fires don't know where they're supposed to go. They're just sitting there. They're doing what fires do. Wind is the primary driver of fires, uh, followed by topography. Uh, fires like to burn uphill. Right? Fires, can, can they burn downhill? Everybody say, yeah, of course they can. Uh, and then the fuel package involved. And it's in what we're going to get into today, the fuel package is not just trees anymore. Part of the fuel package is homes. Now, we can solve this, and I can go home right now, if everyone here built all new construction, build homes out of concrete, CMU, metal roof, metal studs, 5 eighths drywall. Uh, let's do that across all of the world. No more wildfires burning homes down, and we can all go home. Do we want to do that? No, it ain't going to happen. Uh, so here's your three test questions, okay? Wind, topography, and the fuel package. You know, here's a good fire break. There's a road. And the fire, how did it jump the road? Wind. It will now throw embers on some of these big fires up to two miles. I have fought fires and we're sitting there fighting the fire or chunking, call it chunking, chopping fire line with our Pulaski's, these medieval tools that yes, we still use. They're good for crowd control though. But uh, so we're, you know, doing, cutting an 18 inch fire line and <laughs> Here it just jumps a road. The Oakland fires back in the late 80s, it jumped uh, the whole highway to Berkeley, you know, a five lane highway. Uh, coal seam fire in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. The fire jumped a set of railroad tracks, a frontage road, the Colorado River, and I-70. Right, so much for fire breaks. The fire doesn't know. So these embers now we're, we're getting in these huge firestorms due to these events and buildup of fuel over years and years and years of suppression. We're getting ember throw up to two miles. And they're, they're the size of your thumb, a fingernail, but they can retain enough heat in the mass to ignite fires at a distant area, which drives me crazy because then I got secondary ignitions and we're trying to figure out which fire started first. You know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So now you know the answers to the first test question. Other weather factors, all of you know wherever you're from, there is local weather. And part of investigating a fire, for me, is finding out, I talk to the locals, you know, what does the wind do here? What was it doing during the fire? So, you know, I'll get in and start knocking on doors, where was the wind coming from, look at weather forecasts, and try to know what the local weather is. You know, the, the Chinooks are popular along the front range uh, from Wyoming down to New Mexico. The air comes in from the west, gets compressed over the Continental Divide, squeezes down into what we call the front range from Cheyenne all the way down to Albuquerque and good 80 mile an hour winds as it funnels out of the mountains. Santa Ana, we've all read about that in the paper, the Diablo winds uh, in California and they actually blow east to west and they will blow these fires out of the canyons in California right down to the best fire stop in the world, the Pacific Ocean. That has stopped fires. Okay. <laughs> the ocean works. It really does. Uh, you know, winds follow up canyons in the morning when the uh, valleys heat up. It'll push the fire up the canyon. In the end of the day, when the valleys cool off, the wind will come down the canyon. So we'll know what fire spread is doing during those times. Uh, tea storms create their own weather and start moving fires around, which makes my job crazy. Uh, plume fires, we'll show you some pictures of that. Temperature inversions slow down wildfires. That's where you get a big cloud cover and uh, 
uh, fires burning underneath that has nowhere to go and we just get a huge inversion. Uh, a fun story, I was fighting a fire in Humboldt County, California. What's the biggest agricultural product there? Weed! And so there are 10,000 acres of pot burning up and we had an inversion and our whole fire camp was stoned. I, I mean, we ran out of food, we called it Happy Camp. <laughs> it was, I love it. It was the best fire I've ever been at. You know? <laughs> go back to happy camp. That was <laughs> All right. So uh, wind, number one. I have to throw this picture in here. Uh, this is from Winnemucca, Nevada. Have you, anybody been to Winnemucca? They need to let it burn. <laughs> I'm like, why are we fighting this fire in Winnemucca? Uh, but you can see how wind will drive uh, this fire. You can see it just spreading prairie fires. You know, we've read all about those things. It's not just in the crowns of trees or through subdivisions. Here in Winnemucca, it's just running through the, uh, the sage and the, the buffalo grass. Fire, when we start to see fire behavior like this, because weather patterns are getting messed up uh, big time. Well, this is a cool picture that we all took before we hightailed it out of there. Uh, it, it, it raises the blood pressure a little bit, and everybody here had to evacuate real quick. When I was a hot shot, this is a joke, by the way, uh, but when I was a shot, you know, we'd spent two weeks living in the woods eating MREs and canned foods and no showers. I mean, we were disgusting, you know, and then we'd go into town and try to meet the local women, and that, that met with a limited success. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> but, uh, but here on this, uh, you know, at the end, sometimes at the end of the assignments, you know, we get a medical check, and there's always a joke, you know, if the doctor says to you, well, I'm going to need some samples from you, son. I need a stool sample. I need a urine sample. I need a blood sample. And I need a semen sample. And we go, well, oh, doc, you want my underwear? <laughs> <laughs> Our joke. We never actually gave the doc our underwear. <laughs> but I think all those fluids might have, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so when we get terrain and wind, and in particular fuel aligning, we have a synergistic effect in these fires. One plus one equals ten. All right. Once they start combining, it's not just wind. We have topography, we have fuel, and we get, I'm going to show you some cool videos here in a sec, but we get some unbelievable fire spread. But knowing where the fire started, where it was going, helps me with the investigation on it. Other things that help is on investigating fires, when we're looking at the science, it's cell phones. Everyone's got one. People are videoing these things, the ring doorbells, cameras. So they help me immensely uh, in investigating wildfires. Look at the timestamp. This is right on the Colorado-Wyoming border. Uh, and I forget what started this fire, but we're talking a period of, uh, let's see, 1249 to 109. So, you know, 20 minutes at most. And look how fast that thing took off. Need to thank the person that took these pictures. It made the investigation go a lot easier. But uh, these things are moving with incredible speed. We read horror stories. Yesterday in California, two died. People were trying to uh, get out of their driveway in a car. The fire overran the car. That is a fast moving fire when it takes over your car. So everybody go buy a Porsche so you can drive quicker. All right? <laughs> Added to our problem on wildfires, we have diseased forests throughout North America, throughout many parts of the world, you know, uh, beetle kill. Two things happen to old growth forests. The bugs get them or the fire gets them or a combination of both. All right, we have forests that are not in good health. Uh, one, because I'll get on a little bit of a podium here. I don't mean to pontificate by any means, but years of suppression. People that, you know, I was hired to put these things out, but fire is a natural occurrence, and it is healthy for the forest. 
All right? I think we all get that. But it is not healthy when the fire is burning next to a subdivision. So thus, uh, the orders come to extinguish it. After the big burn in 1910 in the western U.S., uh, the government said all fires get suppressed immediately by 10 o'clock the next day. That was the rule. The Forest Service and BLM in their early days was given is suppress these things early, often smush it like a bug, but it created a problem. Uh, what we got was a buildup of fuel that normally would be consumed in uh, normal years where fire would burn and we'd get good natural regrowth and a mosaic pattern and a healthy forest. But we keep putting these things out and we're just allowing everything to grow bigger, 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 drier, drought, and now we have some significant problems. What is the answer? Uh, you know, we can talk about prescribed burns. However, they don't always work well, do they? Los Alamos, New Mexico. New Mexico seems to get a lot of these problems. Uh, took out half of town this summer, the Hermit's Peak Fire in New Mexico. Largest fire in state history in New Mexico. The feds did a prescribed burn and it was not prescribed after a day or two. <laughs> and, you know, 300,000 acres later. <laughs> Other weather things, when we start to get, this is taken in New Mexico, uh, a plume fire. They create their own fire weather. These things move around like a tornado. You know, look at that, the picture, I can use a, a pointer, but I know everyone can't see what I'm pointing at, but at the bottom of this thing, air is getting entrained into the bottom of this thing, shooting it up literally 30,000 feet in the air, tossing embers a couple miles. And these things will just move around like a thunderstorm or a tornado, creating unique, unique patterns, making investigation really difficult. When one of these bumps into a subdivision, just get out of the way. All right? It's not good. It scares me a little bit. You know, this was taken uh, by my backyard. I was the incident commander on this fire. This is in Dillon, Colorado. And that's a big subdivision sitting there in the middle of the smoke, valued at over $1.2 billion in profit. Property. Uh, it's a big resort area, Keystone Vale, Breckenridge, you know, a tough shed cost $200,000 there. So I'm glad I moved. I'm glad I sold when I did. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, this gentleman had a home up there. Uh, imagine what's going through his mind. Uh, uh, not good thoughts, I imagine. Fortunately, we did save this thing uh, with, you know, I, I called in the, literally DC 10s, you know, at $60,000 a drop, spent a quarter million dollars on air support in the first two hours. But look at the property values at risk, over a billion dollars. So was it worth spending a quarter million to dump slurry on it? You bet. I got a little criticized by that, but I'm like, everything's still standing, so no complaints there. As we talked about economic impacts, this fire was right next to Keystone Ski Resort, which is right behind that smoke. A uh, big resort owned by Vail Corp, a big economic generator for the state of Colorado. You take out a ski area, that is millions and millions of dollars of lost tourist revenue that comes in. People who go skiing, uh, you know, Joe comes out to Colorado, thanks for spending money there, Joe, we appreciate it. And uh, uh, you take out a ski area, tourism goes, Burp. you know, Rocky Mountain National Park shutting down, Glacier Mountain Park a few years ago in Montana shutting down. Yellowstone that just had the floods. What's happening to the local economy? It crushes it. So therefore, fires have that indirect impact on uh, the economy. A little bit on fire weather, then we're going to get into some fun stuff. So hang on, okay? This is it's all going to come together. Uh, we know fire weather is important. Things we look at are what was the current weather, what was the past weather. There's all kinds of weather sites, and you can use this in your own jobs. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it as you look at, you know, building safety, building efficiencies, you know, green technologies, whatever uh, is, you know, what is the local weather? 
uh, you know, hot, cold, what's the wind doing, uh, weather underground is a good source, every airport, even small ones, have weather stations, and the feds have uh, a unique uh, weather site called RAWS stations. Very good detailed weather, and that is accessible to the public, we just don't know it's there. RAWS stations stand for Remote Automated Weather Station. They're little things in the woods with a solar thing, and they beam up all the weather data, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them across uh, North America, so we can get some very good uh, weather details that you may not find on commercial weather sites. So take a look at some RAWS data. You can Google it and uh, pop up to it. If we suspect lightning, how do we know lightning caused the fire? Well, a good investigator will get to the, find the tree and find the scar on the tree or a fulgurite in the ground. Those are really cool. It kind of fuses the ground into a hunk of glass. It's just fascinating when you find it and you're like, yeah, I got a whole collection of fulgurites. Uh, but we can also use some commercial applications. Strike net is just but one. So if we get to where we think a fire started and we need to rule in or out lightning, we'll GPS it or get an address and pay StrikeNet 180 bucks and get a very detailed report of a lightning strikes with over 85% accuracy to within 10 meters. Not bad. Don't ask me how they do it. All right, that's the way I'm a nerd. These guys are, that's a whole nother ballpark. But they can get accuracy within 10 meters and well over 85% of the time. I know some of you have, uh, talking with you over the past couple days, have, are somewhat familiar with structural fire investigations. Wildfires are a different animal on investigations. They are. We do things differently. Uh, it, so it, it, structural fire investigators are great at what they do. I, I do some of that. I'd rather be out in the woods and looking at a burnt up foundation. But wildfires are done differently. We look at different causes. We look at the whole new different terminology. The evidence collection is completely different. Uh, the location, is it public? Is it private? Is it BLM? Is it BIA land? Is it state land? Everyone has their own policies on how they dictate things. And uh, we've got to know that because there's different rules in every state. Louisiana especially. You guys know the laws in Louisiana? Whoa! Uh, I, I think I, I try to avoid it. I, I don't mean to offend anybody from Louisiana but they uh, it goes back to Napoleonic law and it's, it's quite unique down there. Uh, I'm an NFPA nerd. I bet you a lot of you are, right? Okay. You won't admit it, but uh, NFPA has a standard or a guide for just about everything, right? You know, those of you that are familiar with NFPA uh, 921 is the Bible, really, for fire investigation. Uh, and it dictates, uh, while it says it's a guide, every time I'm in court, they are holding us to not just a guide. This is an authoritative document. And uh, every fire investigator needs to know it very well, because if you deviate from it, you need to explain to the judge or the jury. And obviously, uh, the attorney on the other side is going to make sure they know that you messed up if you didn't follow some of the NFPA guidelines. And if you look at it, it does say wildfire investigation involves specialized techniques, different equipment, different terminology, which makes it significantly different than structural fire investigations. To me, the science is still the same. We have to formulate, uh, you guys are all very familiar with the scientific method, all right? To find the problem, you develop, you're gathering data, develop a hypothesis, prove the hypothesis, try to dis disprove your hypothesis. We have to do that in court. You don't just walk up and say, yeah, there's a cigarette that started the fire. It, <laughs> it doesn't work like that anymore. Uh, we have to apply the science, and if we don't follow the scientific method on it, I, you get sautéed in court or in a deposition. Uh, there's another NFPA standard for fire investigator qualifications, and it's and here it's very specifically says wildfire investigations have to uh, demonstrate unique skills in in their field, uh, and they will hold all of us to NFPA 1033 standards also. So life gets a little complicated. You can't just wing it anymore and impress everybody with a bunch of acronyms and initials on your business card. Uh, it looks really nice, but you got to follow this stuff. 
All right, here's test question number two. Now let's get into this thing. <laughs> All right, everybody memorizes, next, okay. Now, fires, we look at three things to help us determine where a fire started. One is advancing. Where is this fire going? All right, is it going north, is it going south? Is, I'll show you pictures, is it going east, west? Did the wind blow it here? Did the fuel take it there? That's an advancing fire. Some people call it the head fire. The most dangerous part of a fire, that's what's usually taken out the homes. The whole tsunami effect. When that fire comes rolling through, an advancing fire will leave distinct, and I'll show you, patterns and indicators on the ground. We have uh, backing fires. Fires will fight against the wind. Slow, but they'll back against the wind. The rear or the heel of the fire is where we see backing. Then the sides of it we call the flanks, generally, and they will leave unique patterns. Let's look at some of them. All right, first, here's an advancing fire. Somewhere, I forget where this picture is taken. It should be, well, it looks like Winnemucca again, but who knows. But this fire is going from left to right. The wind's kind of pushing it. It will leave unique patterns and indicators on the ground. An advancing fire, much more intense patterns, easier ones to see. When fires get really significant, it is often difficult to see whether it was advancing or backing when we get a total burnout like this. This was in California at uh, the Tubbs fire, and it was very difficult to, to chase this thing down because we would get these flare-ups and the fire would move all over the place. Backing fire, here you can see the fire is fighting against the wind, and in this case burning slightly from right to left, just the radiant heat as it just moves into the adjacent fuels. Easier, and that's where we start to fight these things because that's the safest part of the fire at the heel or the base or where it's backing. It's not as hot, it's not as intense, though that's often where uh, engine crews or ground pounders, you know, hot shots and hell attack crews will start their attack at the heel of the fire where it's backing and then work up the sides. We call it anchor, flank, and pinch, and you try to pinch off the head of the fire in an ideal world. So, how do we figure out where these things started? One is we have to take a 30,000 acre fire, making up a number, and get it down to one or two acres. How the heck do we do this? So that's step number one. Then step number two, once we get it down to a manageable size, one or two acres where we think it started, we then have to get what we call a specific origin area. And, uh, and there is some methodology in this. I'll walk you briefly through it uh, to get to a workable area, maybe the, about a quarter of the size of this room, 20 by 20 feet, 50 by 50, then the, the whole fun starts on hands and knees trying to find the cause. So we got to go big and narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down to try to find causes. So how do we get a big fire? This was in Wisconsin that helped us. This fire went big, burnt a couple thousand acres. Fortunately, a news helicopter was flying by covering some news event. Just saw this thing start. It was on the local news and we're like, ha perfect. So here we took a 2,000 acre fire and we saw but in its incipient stages, the heel of the fire, it started right down uh, here. So there is a bunch of things that can help us get a 30,000 acre fire down to a manageable thing to look at. Witness statements, uh, everyone's got cell phones, uh, doorbells, first responders, talk to the first firefighters, talk to the cops. There's often ways, uh, look at uh, you know weather forecasts, who called 911. Someone saw this fire when it was smaller. So people are saying, how do you get 50,000 acres and you find the little thing here that started it? Uh, it's through methodology, it's through knocking on doors, it's doing neighborhood canvases, it's very time consuming, or if we get lucky and there's a news helicopter flying over the thing, life gets a lot easier for us. 
Uh, I, I go on YouTube all the time, and, and now TikTok. I guess I'm dating myself. Uh, but I, I know. I'm, but whatever. You know, YouTube, TikTok. It's out there. Someone has videoed something and posted it, and it's often extremely good way uh, to help our investigation. The use of drones has gotten huge. I used to love, because I got to hire helicopters and fly around. That was fun. But a drone's a lot cheaper now than paying 1200 bucks an hour for a helicopter to fly you around. We just get a drone. I've got a, a drone guy in our office. Says, he's a millennial and he can fly these things. I would crash the damn drone. You don't want me flying a drone. But, uh, you know, our, our millennial flies this thing and gets some very good pictures and they are an incredible tool. Drones are in now for wildfire investigation, even structure fire investigations. Drone technology has made our life a lot easier. Here you can see a distinctive heel of the fire down on the bottom right of the screen and you can see the fire arcing out. This was somewhere in Texas, North Texas, and we can see two flanks and that little red arrow is where the fire started. So the fire didn't just always start at the very heel. Fires will back, remember that. So it just shows how useful drones can be uh, for us, especially if I'm, I'm testifying to a jury because they see the CSI stuff and they want, they like pictures, all right? They want to think they're detectives. So I try to get, you know, what does this jury want to see? And I hate, I, I don't mean to sound demeaning, but we have to dumb it down a little bit to whatever you think the intelligence level of the jury is. I'm trying to be PC and I'll mess up. So, uh, another drone picture, this was taken way after a uh, fire. You can see some regrowth or regeneration. This is in Corsicana, Texas. That's where they make fr uh, the home of the fruitcakes. I don't anybody, and I don't mean that in the, bad, the, the real fruitcakes that you eat. <laughs> I didn't know that. I mean, Corsicana, my wife calls me. She goes, you got to bring home a fruitcake. I'm going, what? She goes, it's the fruitcake capital of the world and there's a whole factory that makes fruitcakes in the little tins. So I had to, you know, schlep it onto the airplane. TSA, love that, but uh, <laughs> so be it. But here you can see a subtle, this is a couple months after the fire, but a drone picture does give us, even with some regrowth, which makes our life a little more challenging, the drone helps put it in perspective and you can see somewhat of a heel where there's some green trees, but two flanks going off to the right, so that fire progressed left to right. Now, we use tools. Uh, this isn't on the test because you won't remember this, but uh, we use flagging to give us an overall picture of where this fire went. I've got some pictures of it. We'll use, you know, red flags that show where the fire advanced. We'll use blue flags to show where it backed and yellow flags for the sides. And if we can, we'll use a, a white flag that says it started here. I love it when I get to pull one of them out. So here's what some fire scenes look like painstakingly slow. Hands and knees, this is where we got this large fire down to, this is a specific origin area with all the flags, and we are looking at specific indicators on the ground. I'll show you some pictures of them here in a minute so it'll make sense. But when you look at these flags in totality, they, will, they paint a very good picture on where this fire started. And I know some of you are staring at and saying, WTF? I don't see, all I see is flags. But, but we are looking, when we get to where the fire started, very small indicators, magnifying glasses to see what the fire left on the ground. Fires that you think destroy evidence. They do, but they also create evidence. As a fire burns, it is leaving distinct patterns and indicators on the ground for us to look at. It's, just, it's fascinating. So these flags, they're just used strictly as a tool. I've got a few more picks. This is this that fire you just looked at as we narrowed it down. You can see the blue, the fire back toward the bottom of the screen, red, the fire advance up toward the top, and then a little bit of a flank. This is literally, you know, five square feet here, and it was a painstaking process, hands and knees with a grid search. When we're labeling each grid, I know some of you have seen structure fires where we'll grid things out, but we also do that in, in wildfires. 
And this is what it's like. You got two or three watching, people taking pictures, 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 but then the hands and knees stuff. I carry knee pads with me because I got a bad back anymore, but uh, uh, time and diligence uh, will get us to where a fire started. And when we get to an origin or find the cause, then documentation is key. We use GPS, of course, but is there some degree of inaccuracy with GPS? Say yes. Okay, it just depends how good your GPS device is. So in addition to GPS, we'll also create reference points, things that won't go away, like a big rock. And we'll measure from the big rock at 131 degrees, and it's 26 feet two inches from the big rock at 180. So we'll triangulate it with some reference points that don't move. It's just a backup for GPS because attorneys have learned to shoot holes in it. And I got asked in a deposition a couple months ago, how accurate is Google Earth? And I didn't have the answer. I had a Google, Google Earth, and still didn't get it. That's a new one. I had a Google, Google Earth. Uh, I still didn't get an answer on that. Maybe some of, some of you know if there's some degree of what the accuracy is on Google Earth. And then when we get to what we think is the cause, evidence collection is very meticulous. All right, there has been cases lost because someone will pick up a piece of evidence inappropriately, put it in a bag, and spoliate that evidence. So if we find find something that started, we have to put other people on notice if there is a party at fault so they can have an investigator there to document it because if you spoliate it or remove evidence inappropriately, the other side's going to just nail you. So once we find the evidence, we got to preserve it and take it. There is ANSI standards. Actually, I, I, I'm sure some of you know this, on evidence collection, evidence preservation. If you really want to get bored, read ANSI standards. My gosh, it'll help you sleep. There are a lot of mistakes we can make investigating these fires. Uh, the methodology, the science is huge. If we deviate from it, you're going to be held accountable. So I try to do every fire investigation the same. And they'll say, why do you do this? Because it, it works. I say, well, I did it different here. Then you have to answer why. So I, I try to do things identical and use that methodology and follow the science if I can. It's a team approach with documentation, with notes, with diagrams, with pictures, with drones. Uh, burn patterns sometimes will mess us up. We got to circle this thing one way clockwise and another counterclockwise because you see stuff on the ground when you're doing, looking at it from different angles. A little bit of levity here. You know, the economy's tough, and I know some of you have seen this, but if any of your clients can't afford a smoke detector, buy them some Jiffy Pop, <laughs> put it over their bed, and when the Jiffy Pop goes, then it's time to get out of the bedroom. <laughs> Yeah, we Joe called a redneck smoke detector, okay? <laughs> Joe said I don't have to be too PC here, so, okay. <laughs> so, you know, in tough times, just buy all your clients some Jiffy Pop. If they have smoke detectors, then they can eat the Jiffy Pop. So, <laughs> but someone did see this. I, I forget the history of this slide. It's hilarious. <laughs> anyway. So what do we look at? When you saw all those flags on the ground, and I know you're saying, what are you looking at, Jeff? You know, this is all Greek to me. This is some of the stuff we are looking for. I'll show you pictures, and it will make uh, a little more sense here in a second, is uh, some areas get protected. When a fire hits one area, the other side of a log or a rock may be protected from that fire and we won't see uh, damage to it. Grass stems will curl toward where that fire came from. I'll show you a picture of it. Needle freeze on conifer trees. As that fire comes rolling through, those needles will actually freeze pointing in the direction the fire was going. I'll show you a picture. It'll make a lot more sense. It's just fascinating. Uh, we'll see sooting on like a T-post on a barbed wire fence. One side of the T-post will have sooting. I rub my hands on it. If they come out black, I know the fire hit that T-post from one side, and the other side has nothing on it. It's uh, really kind of neat. Uh, degree of damage is one side of a tree or a fence post burn more than another. The depth of char 
get a little measuring device. Uh, it can be as simple as a pocket knife, seeing how deep the char is. The deeper the char on one side than the other shows the fire made a hit. Angle of char, I can try to explain it, but a picture I have will do it better. Uh, spalling, what you've seen in concrete and structure fires, also happens in wildfires. We could, rocks have moisture in them. As a fire hits a rock, that moisture expands and parts of it pop off and spalls, just like we see on concrete floors and structure fires. And that will be an indicator that we can look at, is looking at rocks. Uh, white ash, show you a picture of that. When a fire hits a tree, it'll leave white ash on one side where the fire came from and not the other side. Let's look at some pictures. Uh, forget where this is. This guy's backyard, there was a fire well, way you know, out in the woods, came toward this uh, person's home. This guy had a big, beautiful backyard, was a golfer, obviously, and was hitting thousands of golf balls in his back. I always wanted that, have a driving range in your backyard. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> and the guy paid his kid like a nickel or a penny to go get all the golf balls. <laughs> Pretty good deal for the kid. But all over this guy's backyard, and uh, that's still a good golf ball for me. The way I play golf, that might get rid of my slice. I don't know. <laughs> but here you can clearly see on this top flight, I think it's top flight, that fire impacted it from the right to the left. All right, an indicator. Who would have thought to look at golf balls to tell you where the fire came from? But here it came from right to left. Degree of damage and char. This is a, what remained of a power pole. This fire came from right to left. It impacted this thing. Look at the loss of mass in that thing. So this fire just chewed it up. It came from right to left, chewed this thing up a little bit. Another indicator that would get a red flag. The fire advanced and hit this thing. This one's going to mess with your head. This was in Waldron, Kansas. I still don't know where that is, but I was there. Uh, but where did the fire come from? You know, and I bet you a lot of you are going to say, from the left. Aha, who said right? Okay, I owe you a drink tonight. Yeah. It's on the house. <laughs> Joe said he'd buy it for you. All right. But this fire actually came from right to left. It's called angle of char. The fire came in low and burnt up the back of that tree. It was wind driven from right to left. It defies logic. But the fire came along the ground, hit the bottom of this tree on the bottom right, and burnt up the backside. It almost makes like an eddy effect, if you will. So it's a very good pattern. I know this is geeky nerd stuff, but I'm fascinated by it. And it just, it's an extremely good pattern. So right to left here. Here's another angle of char. This fire came from right to left. It came into this, was a juniper or something, came in the bottom, burnt up the backside. Clearly a wind push advancing fire. So, do you not, am I making sense? I don't know how else to explain that. This was in Florida. Yes, Florida has wildfires. This armadillo didn't make it. They're not that fast on the ground. But the armadillo, in this case, helped us determine which way the fire came. You can see the staining, the sooting on one side of the armadillo. So it came really from the bottom and hit the, the, the critter as it tried to escape. But uh, an extremely good pattern. So we have to look at these in totality. And yes, there is fires in Florida. And I don't like doing them down there because everything wants your blood. You know? <laughs> Florida, Georgia, I just did fires in the great sm last week. I was up in the Smoky Mountains uh, from some March fires. There are bees. There's snakes that are not good snakes. There's yellow jacket nests. I stepped in one. I still got bites all over so I'd rather stay up north <laughs> I don't like walking around with things that want my blood <laughs> all right now that we talked about angle of char which direction did this fire come from hmm it came from right to left you can see all the char on the, and, and the staining, rather, on the left side. But this, this fire came in low, hit this power pole, and it went up the back side where it was protected. So it wrapped the fire around the back of this power pole and ran up. Think of uh, any of you rafted or kayaked in a river. It's kind of like an eddy. You know, it hits 
the rock and goes around and the backside where the wind doesn't affect it, it walks right up the backside. Just, it's fascinating. And the higher up that char or the sooting is on that pole shows me the higher intensity of the wind. I've seen some go up, you know, 40, 50 feet. Other times it's just three, four feet off the ground and it wasn't as windy. So it's just uh, something fascinating to look at. And it, it, it's the science. And this has all been proven in laboratory analysis. So I'm not making this up. And there is some, uh, fortunately, a grant that just came out. I think it's uh, Core Logics doing, some of you may be familiar with them, but a research firm and they're reevaluating all these fire patterns to determine the validity uh, once again. So I think it's fa fantastic that we're keeping science involved. Which way did this fire come from? Well, the picture here shows you. This was at the, which fire was this? This was at the Tubbs fire outside of uh, Calistoga, Napa County. Big, big fire, you know, dozens of people died in this fire. A certain utility, I won't name names, uh, was held liable for it. Uh, and it cost them some big bucks. But look, at it's kind of like needle freeze on this one. This fire came from, I'm looking at it backwards here, from right to left. And I use these little signs, direction of fire, because juries love that stuff. They don't understand flags. If I show them a bunch of red and blue and yellow flags, they're like, dude, take off your suit and tie and go away. But if you, if you have a picture that shows this and explain it to a jury, it makes a lot more sense. So this fire came from right to left, causing some needle freeze in this particular shrub. This fire came from the bottom of the screen to the top. You can see how it shoot off the bottom of the log. That gets a red flag. Hard to see, but I'm using this little pointer at an egg corn on the ground. I know this is nerdy stuff, but you can get on hands and knees, look at an egg corn, and see that where this fire hit it, in this case, from right to left. If it, it's a little dark, and I apologize, but you can see the bottom right of that egg corn is burned, and the left side, the top left of it, is not burned. Uh, uh, it's called a micro indicator, and I got to put on reading glasses for some of this, or get a magnifying glass because I'm getting old, but it works. Spalling. I told you it happens. All right, this fire impacted this rock, rock from right to left. Fire front came f through. Some moisture in the rock caused it to pop right off. So we're looking at all of these things in totality. This particular fruit, I don't know what it was. This was from the Atlas fire, again near uh, Mapa and Sonoma County. Burnt up a bunch of vineyards. Now that's a crime. When we start messing with alcohol, I get pissed off. <laughs> All right. Don't burn up. <laughs> and that really impacted the whole uh, wine industry in California. Not only burning some vineyards, but the, I guess the smoke deposits. No one likes, you want smoky in what? Bourbon, I guess. But no one wants smoky wine, or at least I don't. You know, I drink wine out of a box, so I guess it doesn't matter. But, like, <laughs> but you know, here it clearly impacted this hanging fruit from right to left. Uh, lots of stuff to look at. Seek and ye shall find. A backing fire, this beer can out in the middle of nowhere, the fire backed very subtly, and there's some slight staining on the right side of this can. It's hard to see because there's a few shadows. They should probably get a better picture, but it backed into this can. The left side is unaffected, the right side is stained. Curling. Again, hands and knees. This fire came from left to right and actually just bent these things right over as the fire front came through and just impacted these thistles right here. Another indicator, advancing fire. You can see with the red flag. Here, the fire backed into this log. You can see it backed from right, hit that downed tree on the right side, the left side, or the top of your, the slide shows it's unburned. Uh, it's just, you needed to sit there and stare at things. And sometimes I'll bring a lawn chair out there. And people are like, what? And I just sit there and I stare for a little bit and just let it soak in. And, you know, I do kumbaya and it all comes, it happened. <laughs> More needle freeze. This fire came from left to right. Just froze those conifer branches as the, the fire front came through. Didn't consume all of them, but it just, uh, the wind, it sucked the moisture right out of them and just froze those needles. I think there's one more 
anymore? Ah, this is even better. My job, I get to look at cow shit. <laughs> How many of you get paid to look at cow shit? <laughs> it's a wonderful way to earn a living, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but cow patties, when uh, you're out in, in Texas or wherever, uh, this was in Texas, and hands and knees, and I'm looking at cow poop, I'm looking at deer poop, I'm looking at mice poop, because the fire, it is organic material. R right, Doc? Yes. Okay. All right. It's got microbes, I bet, too. Anyway, <laughs> I have to pick on you because you're right here. <laughs> but here, this uh, cow patty took a hit from left to right, uh, a good indicator to look at. Even though there's some regeneration, this was taken several weeks after the fire, and it's already starting to green up. But there's still stuff on the ground for us to look at. A bone fragment. Don't know what kind of critter this was, but this particular indicator of the fire came from bottom left to top right and chewed up part of this uh, bone right here. A scapula. A scapula. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully not a human scapula. I don't know. Uh, here's some white ash on this tree. So it took a hit from right to left. This is in the Butte. The Butte fire outside of Sacramento uh, killed several people, burned down a bunch of homes, but very clear indicators in some of those trees of the white ash deposits uh, facing uh, me where I took this picture, and the fire came from right to left. Another uh, depth of char, this fire came into this, what remains of this tree stump from left to right. Advancing indicator, got my little sign there for the jury saying direction of fire spread. Uh, so all these things in totality are helping us narrow things down to where this fire started. And I think pictures do a lot better than me trying to explain this. At least for me they do, because I, I got a simple mind. More white ash. You know, it impacted this from right to left, left some clear indicators it will disappear over time, so it's nice to get there when the fire is literally still burning. This will mess with your heads a little bit. Backing fire. This fire came from right to left to right. I'm looking at it sideways, I apologize. And what happens is the fire backed into these grass stems, burnt the bottom of them, and the very low intensity fire, and the grass stems fall over and point in the direction the fire came. It's fascinating. Try this in your backyard, okay? Get some, get some grass, light it, and just watch the fire hit the bottom of the grass stems, and they fall over right to where you flick your bick. Guarantee it'll work every time. Just tell your neighbor okay? My neighbors, they, they don't want to talk to me. <laughs> and if we're lucky, we can find evidence. All right, this literally was on a 1,500 acre fire, and I like it when they're stupid arsonists. All right, we <laughs> leave it on the scene, of course. And then what do we get? Fingerprints. Now that's above me, you know, we bag it and I get it, send it to the crime lab, and they did get fingerprints and did tie it to an individual that was seen in the area. So we, we were following this individual and uh, law, we were working with law on it, and they put one of those tracking cameras. They actually fished it in the taillight of the person's car. I think, I don't know if you need a court order for that or whatever, you do, okay? I got the attorney here saying, yeah, you do. <laughs> but uh, the cops put a, a tracker in this gentleman's car because we were getting uh, these fires. This is in Idaho, and, and there, there was a, a serial arsonist, and we knew the person was there, uh, and we, had, we suspected it. They put a tracker in the car, which was step one. Step two, the idiot left a lighter here, which is just great. I love dumb criminals and fingerprints. You know, so if you're going to start a fire, wear latex gloves so you don't, never mind. <laughs> and if we're lucky, how good are you? What started this fire? Come on, squint. I know it's hard in the back. Yeah, what do, I, what do I see right here? I can't get the pointer to everybody. Match, match, match. Can you guys see over there those matches right in the middle? All right. This is why we are going hands and knees and grid searching this with a magnifying glass because these things are hard to see. But matches remain. A little bit of luck here that a firefighter with the size 13 boot didn't step on it because that would really mess things up. Or the hose jockeys hitting it, you know, with a 
couple hundred gallons a minute. That would certainly screw things up or a slurry load on it. But by following these indicators back, we start to look for the cause. I'd like to say it's all skill. This was a little bit of luck, but we found these matches in a large fire. Just fascinating. Question. Why are there four or five matches? They got a group of, I don't know if one worked, or I, I forget the, the process, but they were, and a lot of people, uh, people, a lot of arsonists will use a matchbook, and the striker plate will still be there. We can find the striker plate, and a common time delay device, if you want to start a fire and maybe not get caught, now that I'm telling you this, you know, you, you get a cigarette, put it in a book of matches, and light the cigarette, uh, so just the end of the cigarette's impacting the tip of the match. It's a time delay. Light the cigarette, you know, put it in a book of matches, throw it out your car window, cigarette burns, lights the matches. You got about a 10 minute time period to escape. Works real well. Uh, actually, in, uh, a fire investigator in California, uh, this, uh, his name was John Orr, and he was solving all these fires. You know why he solved them? Because he started them. He's in jail right now because there was a fatality. But uh, it's fascinating. Uh, uh, Wombat wrote a book about it called Fire Lover or something. And Orr even wrote a book about his own fires. And the guy got caught, thank God. He's in for life, which is good. Still denies everything. But there's a few bad apples. I haven't been caught yet, that's all. <laughs> all right, I know I'm on Zoom. Sorry, Zoom people. It's not me. <laughs> now, we've got to rule things out uh, on a fire when we determine the cause. We can't just say it was the cigarette lighter. Uh, the court systems will require that we systematically rule things out. You know, smoking, campfires, you know, you can read the list. I'm not going to read them to you. What's a holdover fire? That's where someone's burning some slash in their backyard or an ag burn or even a lightning strike. Fires will sit and smolder for days in some cases. There has been cases of fire, I investigated one, it was called the Topaz Mountain Fire, and the feds did a huge prescribed burn and they, a bone pile, they call them. They make big teepees, a big timber, and they were burning them. They burnt it in November. This was in the high country, this was in Colorado, and winter came covered it all with snow. That fire sat latent throughout the winter in an oxygen deprived atmosphere and in the springtime when it burnt off, when the snow melted off, wind picked up, there was still enough latent heat to start a fire. So that's a holdover fire. Fascinating. Uh, and here's some of the other things. And there's a, a fancy legal term in there, negative corpus. Ah, uh, negative. Can we rely? I, and I go, you know, jury, um, we've ruled everything else out, so it has to be this. Well, the legal system is still saying we have to use the science and find the cause. Just because we've ruled everything else out, our judicial system, at least in the U.S., still says we have to determine the cause and prove the material material first ignited, even though we've ruled everything else out. They want that one extra step, which makes things a little more challenging. We'll show you some pictures of some of these here. You know, utilities, they keep me employed. I work for and against power companies. Uh, in this case, this was a uh, line slap where in a high wind environment, we'll get two conductors and they'll start slapping or galloping. Uh, I know there's some electrical gurus here, so I think you know what I'm talking about. But in high wind events, particularly when it's very hot out, uh, what happens? The lines sag even more due to the high heat. And if they're not tightened up or we got a long span, we will get line slap. What happens? Line to line, conductor to neutral, conductor to conductor, and aluminum melt set. Test question, about 1220 degrees Fahrenheit. And is that hot enough to start a wildfire? You bet. Okay. Oh, well, how hot? Well, what is the fuel ignition temperature for wildfires? Anybody know? Test question. What did you say? 
I love it. I'm going to buy you a drink now. The front row is what you two guys. All right, you and teachers. Pro about to, to an hour. It depends on how dry the fuel is, of course, and the moisture and the type of fuel. But around 450 Fahrenheit is when we'll start to get some auto ignition on, on a dry fuel bed. And here, molten aluminum is coming off at 1220. Now, I know it's going to lose heat as it falls to the ground, right? But it depends how big the mass is. The larger the mass, the more it's going to retain the heat as it uh, falls to the ground. So we will get ignition from line slap. It's coming off at 1200 degrees. All we need is around 450 to 480 to start a ground fire. This was some abrasion from a tree rubbing on a line. All right, tree on a conductor, the tree acts as the ground, bad, okay? And we get some abrasion, we get some ember fall from the tree, and thus we have a fire. So not only, you know, what I said about negative corpus on a fire, I gotta rule out smoking, campfire, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, fireworks, a little billy plane with a lighter, but now we have to find positive identification of how it started. This does it when we show this picture. This fire, was, it, this was a large fire. This branch was found 80 feet up and it was rubbing on a power line. So we knew it started near there, have to, had to hire a bucket truck, go up and actually obtain this branch. You can see the burnt area right up there on the left side of the picture. This was 80 feet off the ground, but there was enough chafing and abrasion to cause ember fall onto the ground. And again, took it into evidence. The tree, unfortunately, was in the right of way, which should have been removed. Many utility companies, they do a great job, but sometimes the companies they subcontract to, names are not important, you're probably familiar with some, don't do an adequate job of clearing trees in the right of way and then there's some third party liability involved there. I cannot believe this happened. This is where people, this, I, I couldn't believe I saw this. This tree grew around a power line. I've never seen anything, and it didn't start a fire, but it blew me away. It, this was in the western U.S. The utility company's name isn't important, but I cannot believe they let this stuff happen. This is job security for people like me. I don't need to buy a Powerball ticket. We got idiots, let, never mind. <laughs> How am I doing on time here? 39. Oh, good. Right. This, be, this fire, you know, you know we'll, we'll get into some stuff. This is a, called a transposition pole uh, on, a, on a transmission line. And some of you may not be familiar with it, but here, this started the, uh, the it was called the campfire in uh, Paradise, California. Killed 86, 89 people. Wiped out the entire town. A transposition pole. And that's where a conductor on the left side of the transmission tower gets rerouted to the other side. It's for uh, balance and capacity. So every few miles they route it from one side of the transmission tower to the other. And something came loose. You can see the hanging wires. It slapped against the lattice tower. This one incident, and this was Pacific Gas and Electric, I'll say a name because they've already admitted to it, uh, did start this fire. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, here's, this is from a gin mill outside of Lubbock, Texas, and some rocket scientists had the exhaust from the cotton gin spewing out dust, hanging on power lines that acted like a sail, and of course these lines are going to slap and create issues. So, you know, is this the utility company's fault, or is it the gin mill, or both, or neither? Interesting, but I think, why would you, never mind, put an exhaust next to a a power line. Cigarette ignitions, they get a bad rap. To, to, for a cigarette to start a wildfire, everything has to align perfectly. It really does. The tip has to be touching the ground. We have to have the right amount of fuel moisture, the right ambient temperature. Cigarettes through the Safe Cigarette Act, they have gotten safer. They can and do start fires, don't get me wrong. And there's been a lot of experiments uh, using joints, marijuana cigarettes. I'd like to be part of that test study and try to get them to start fires. But everything has to align for a cigarette to start a fire. But they can and they do start fires. 
and there's some statistics, and I'll bore you, but the, the planets need to align, particularly the humidity involved. We need to have a, a lower humidity and a low fuel moisture. Uh, if it's over 22%, which rules out a lot of the fires here on the East Coast, uh, cigarette ignition's extremely, extremely difficult. So that's the good news. Both. The moisture content, the dead, the fuel moisture in the, the fuel has to be below a certain percentage, 8 to 10 percent. The RH also has to be below 22 percent. So good question. Both. Both. These were a bunch of matches. It was uh, someone was cooking meth, and I know there's a lot of different ways to make meth, but they were using matches. These are all matchsticks out in the woods. A fire did result from it, and we traced it back to this. And obviously, we got the feds involved because manufacturing a meth that's way out of my wheelhouse. But it's not normal to have a thousand matches sitting there. This is a, a redneck. Uh, time delay device, you got uh, those fire starter things that you light and put in a fireplace and it slowly lets you start a fire, but then they, you can see they stuck matches in the top, wrapped it up, uh, this was actually from Louisiana, uh, light the matches, it's a good time delay device, uh, you know, try it if you want, it works, but we'll catch you. Another match found right here, it's right by the number three on this ruler which I stole, I borrowed from ATF. All right, don't tell the feds. <laughs> but I, can you see that match? Look just to the left of the number three. This is what we're looking for. I'm gonna keep moving here for time purposes. I'm using LIDAR a lot. Some of you may be familiar in your line of work. LIDAR is fascinating technology. It's literally a 3D scan of the entire scene. We'll set up LIDAR. It'll give us the distance from that light bulb to that power cord over there, from a tree branch to a dandelion across the street. Fascinating tool is, is LIDAR, light imaging and detection radar. I think that's right. Uh, it, it uses up a lot of memory, about a terabyte for each scene. But uh, fascinating uh, way to do it. Uh, here we use drones and LIDAR. This uh, farmer plowed his field already. And I'm going to show you, let's see if I can get this thing to go. This is what LIDAR will do. This combine LIDAR with a drone, combine the two, and imagine, I can just talk a jury through this. Look at the measurements we're getting, accurate within you know, a tenth of an inch. Fascinating. So we get drone pics, we combine it with LIDAR, and we can get a complete 3D image of a scene. I love it. Now I just got to figure out how to get out. A quick case study, all right, for you building scientists. This fire was started by downed power lines. This is outside of Amarillo, Texas. Power lines are down the ground, impacted a uh, metal horse fence, energized the whole fence, started a fire. The sub-row attorneys, and I was the one investigator uh, representing the power company here, they were salivating. They're saying, box, ching, 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 ching. And look closer, here's the lines on the horse fence that ignited this whole area. Now you building science folks, are you seeing anything unusual? When was this fire? Early 90s. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was outside of Amarillo, I forget the subdivision. But look, look at that building in the back, we'll get a closer look, all right? You guys are engineers, architects, builders. All right, so the line came down on this fence, energized it, started the fire. Here's where the line impacted the fence. Energize it. No doubt about it. Energize line. But look across the street. There was a wind event. Look at that outbuilding. Do you see something wrong with it? Come on, you're building, folks. Say yes. That's not a normal roof. We had a wind event coming and impacted underneath this overhanging roof, blew the top of the roof off, and hit the power lines. So here it's chicken or the egg. Well, it's, the power line started the fire, but what was the cause of the cause? I made that up, but it sounds real cool. Got some better pictures. Here's where the roof impacted the energized lines. I think I got another picture. More roof. So this roof took out the power lines. So the subro attorneys, they all took 
off, went to lunch. They're like, because one of them was representing the insurance company that owned that little outbuilding. <laughs> I don't have time for this. Maybe we'll come back to it. Uh, so fun job here. Now we're going to switch gears slightly. Every state in the U.S has a fire problem. Every province in Canada has a fire problem. It really does. Even Hawaii. I can't wait to get a job in Hawaii. I mean, I fought, I fought fires. I've investigated in probably 30 states. I'm still waiting for that Hawaii assignment. Just, I can't wait, but there is the dry sides of the island. In, insurance companies have a big stake in this. They are no longer willing to write big checks. What are our problems here? Density, community infrastructure. We are now having fires burn right into neighborhoods. Uh, the Marshall Fire, when Joe and I were talking about this back in January when he coerced me into coming here, the Marshall Fire, uh, people, it was on New Year's Eve. This is in Colorado. It's winter. People were skiing all day up, you know, Vail, Breckenridge, you know, enjoying, recreating, and they come home, this is right next to the city of Boulder, they come home and their town is gone, Superior, Colorado. It was gone, 1,100 homes burned in the middle of winter. So times are changing. Okay, what a bad feeling, you're skiing all day, you come home and it's gone. Uh, political climate, we'll talk briefly about the codes uh, on here, but politics, we know it, people are very passionate about it, and it varies from state to state, community to community, and obviously country to country. People in some parts of the, I'll talk about the U.S. in particular, don't like codes. They don't like government, they don't like being told what to do, how to build, what happens, and and there is an assumed risk, at least on their part. So it is kind of a little challenging when we get the politics involved in it and how much do we regulate. And we'll talk about the codes. Very charged subject on that. Uh, some of the codes we use, well, we'll get to them in a sec. I do want to show this. I think we've got, uh, yeah, i got time. I'll, be, I'll go quick. This was in Reno, Nevada. I'm sure they've got this called in. Started by a bottle rocket. It's, it's, it's got that one. It's going to get the one on the other side, too. There's no and doubt Look how about quickly it. it's walked up this hill. You're building experts. How are you going to stop these buildings from burning? Here. Keep it going, Dan. Sometimes you, you can't, unless you build these things out of concrete. Holy cow. I mean, this was in minutes of that model rocket, walked right up the hill, ended up taking out half a dozen homes. Yeah. Structures involved. Zoom ahead a little bit for time purposes. You can see here it's flanking up. Going to the left, we now got three structures involved. just continues. I think it's one bottle rocket. This is literally in four minutes. That scares the daylights out of me. So that's what we have to contend with, building folks. Kind of scary. Put your codes to work on that one. Here's Smokey's kind of low under a flood. I like that. Why is this house standing? What's good about it? Good defensible space, good tree clearing, metal roof. Here was a fairly active fire, but yet the home is standing. We'll talk about that in a sec. Defensible space, limbing trees, cutting them up six feet, getting rid of the ladder fuels, very helpful. People like their landscaping, but it is challenging. There's risk maps in every state we live in. Look up yours, see what your fire risk is. Insurance companies look at this and adjust your rates. And this I want to go through quickly. We're going to start with our ember generators, which we use to recreate a realistic ember exposure. Embers are those small burning and smoldering particles that may travel ahead of the fire front. And what we do with our generators, we create the realistic exposure, and in our wind tunnel, we're able to throw them at a building. And then we have a building that has two sides to it, a good side, which uses wildfire resistant construction, and what we're considering a typical building that we would see in a wildfire prone area. So put your building science to use here. Good side, bad side. What's good about the right side? Non-combustible siding, non-combustible decorative material on the right side. Bad on the left, wooden deck. 
shake shingles. Exactly as we expected, that mulch on the ground there caught fire from the embers. The fire from the mulch burned up under this, this deck, and this whole deck was on fire. And so this fire on this deck caused flames right against the home. And then if we look there at the base of the door, there was actually the flames from this deck that burned through the bottom of the door. And on the inside of the house, we started to see smoke and flames. And so because this deck was a combustible material attached to the building, when the embers led to the ignition of this deck, we got flames inside of the building. Here we are on the wildfire resistant side of the house where we had non-combustible siding, a five foot non-combustible zone and six inch gap. We had a metal gutter and multi-pane windows. And we see in comparison to the non-wildfire resistant side, the side had the same ember exposure. If you look here in the mulch, you can actually see some of the embers that had accumulated, but because they had no susceptible fuel to ignite, they just landed there and fizzled out. And here we have ornament vegetation that again is susceptible to the embers but because it's more than five feet away from the home it didn't have enough energy to ignite and it never led to a flame impact on the building. The thing I want to emphasize here, uh, I'm not going to get into detailed construction analysis. You're the experts on that. You know what is combustible, what is not. When homes breathe, there is openings. Openings are bad, because what gets in openings? Embers, and then we have a situation. Here, they make a very good point, is the homes are now the fuel. It's not just the trees. The homes are the fuel involved, which just scares the daylights out of me. Times are changing. It changes our tactics on putting these things out. So the neighboring structures, how close are you to your neighbor's house? There is the problem. I want to conclude. You know, here is a problem. Here is a diseased bug kill forest with condos backing up to it. What is going to happen if there's a fire? Bye bye condos, bye bye subdivision. Then the homes themselves become a fuel package. And people just don't get it. They want to live in the woods and see the birds and bees. I do too. All right. This is what's left of the Marshall Fire, coming in to investigate it. Imagine coming home from skiing all day, and this is what you see. But I still see trees standing, but yet the homes are gone. The homes were the fuel in this case. 100 mile an hour winds going home to home to home. The radiant heat and a BTU heat release rate and the amount of watts generated by these homes. We're getting home to home ignition, and yet there's trees standing. All right, welcome to the new world. There's codes out there. Okay, I can spend, the next Joe gave me eight hours, so I got plenty of time. <laughs> but there are codes, the WUI code, uh, and, and active in some parts of the US, some communities adopt part of it. Uh, NFPA, of course, has a code. Uh, California, of course, has to be by themselves and have their own code. Robert told me from uh, Canada has their version of a WUI code. Uh, so it's out there, some people don't like it because it prescribes construction techniques, it prescribes defensible space and some building practices. But uh, a useful code, but it is applicable, it's a local decision, it is a political decision, and there are some monetary impacts on it. And now, to conclude, this is where I have seen structures lost. I can spend days on this, you guys are the experts, but soffit spaces are a weak link. All right, because we do have some openings in them, gable ends, unless they're protected, embers get in the gable ends. This is the last slide, I promise. Uh, overhead de overhanging decks, you saw in that video from Reno, what happened? That fire walked up the hill, these overhanging decks became a heat trap, and boom. So would truck stacking help? Perhaps. But I might have been delaying it a little bit in that Reno fire. Uh, so deck construction materials, you know, Trex has gained popularity. I know it's a little more pricey. Non-combustible siding is so important, particularly under four or five feet, whether it's stucco, whether it's wash rock, uh, hardy boards, something non-combustible, because that right next, that's a very vulnerable part of the home. Uh, decorative combustible landscaping, what is that? Wood chips. Okay, people go to Lowe's and Home Depot and buy the little pretty wood chips and they put them right up to the house 
house and under their decks because it looks great. They burn. Okay, we get embers land in them, they burn, then the house burns. So if, think about it. It looks nice. Uh, Non-combustible roofs, I know you, you've, you are experts on it, but we want, you know, class A, class B roofs, shake shingle roofs, even though some have ratings, just don't seem to hold up, particularly with UV and altitude and all that. I don't want to get on a rabbit trail. Uh, Non-combustible fencing. I like that white picket fence at Joe's house. And But what we saw, what I saw in the Marshall Fire in Boulder, it was running down the white picket fences from one yard to the next. I, you know, I've never seen that before. So times are changing. I'm not saying you have to do metal fences, but the, the wooden fences in people's yards are spreading it from home to home. And there's various ways to protect gutters, but what do they fill with? They fill with crap, with pine needles, all kinds of debris, even with the screens on it. We get embers in the gutters. They burn the fascia material, get into the roof, and the party is over. And I think I am going to get cut off here. We've got time for a few questions. Questions. So it's a fascinating business. It's uh, I love it. I'm a nerd on it, uh, but it's very rewarding. And hopefully, with your expertise, uh, we're making buildings safer. So thank you. Absolutely. We have time. We're going to take time for some questions. Um, questions. Don't you have any burning issues? I hope issues? there's none. I want coffee. No, no, no burning issues? Oh. This is less of a technical question than a psychological one. So, like, what is going on with an arsonist? <laughs> It would. I'm glad a woman asked that question. But no, uh, and seriously, there, look at uh, arsonists. There are significant traits with them. One, psychological. Two, arsonists, financial. You know, they always tell us, follow the money, follow the money. But some people are, have really a disorder and they're fascinated by fire. And they will return to the scene. So when we get to a fire, we, I videotape people around because arsonists want to look at their work. Uh, oftentimes in divorces, marriages gone bad, arsonists do it. Women are particularly upset. They will burn the husband's clothes. This, I'm talking structure fires. So, you know, guys, don't piss off the wife. You get your underwear wear burned. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, you know, there's some psychological issues. There is the uh, entertainment aspect for some people that are just fascinated by the fire. But money, money, money uh, on a lot of them. Uh, insurance fraud. It's huge. Sir. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Edward from Piano. Uh, for locations get get a wildfire every single year. How do you tell the evidence from one year to not from previous years? Good question. So if I understand your question, if there was a previous fire, how do you know what is what fire it's from? And I, I just did one in Tennessee, and there was a burn from four years ago. So what we had to do was look at what I called, I showed you some pictures, the micro patterns. They will not last from year to year. So spalling on a rock will stay there for a few years. So I, I've got to look at it in totality and look at the micro patterns that are fresh, such as a cow patty, such as that egg corn I showed you, such as the grass stems that were bent over. So I, I, I've got to disregard some patterns and look at the micro patterns. Good question. Yeah, so mine is similar to other investigations like for floods. So a hurricane happens and FEMA comes in and says, oh, let me assess the damage in your house. And they're like, oh, no, that's flooding, even though it came from the hurricane. And that's, if you don't have flood insurance, you're effed. But they'll say, oh, and that's wind damage. Or they try and separate all this crap so the insurance company can get away and say they're not liable. Is that headed towards your industry? Is they're saying that, well, there was a fire, but really some of that was caused by wind. I just want to make sure that's not happening because it really is frustrating for homeowners to realize I don't I wasn't covered yeah not yet 
But insurance companies are dropping coverage. They've got clout more than codes. Insurance companies, they call it reducing their liability or their risk in certain subdivisions. So I'm, I'll just use an insurance. If Liberty Mutual is insuring 80% of a subdivision, they're putting all their eggs in one basket. That subdivision goes away. They're writing a big check. Uh, so they will deny coverage or they won't start new policies. But I have not heard them dropping coverage. But read your policies, read the fine print, take a picture of everything in your house and store it up in the cloud. Because if your house is gone, you have to show what was in there. You mentioned your marker, the white ash. I'm assuming that's the direction that the fire is coming in. It's a hotter uh, material left behind. The, the white ash? Yeah. Yes, that's just from the head of the fire. It's burning close to 1,800 degrees, and that leaves that white ash. OK, thanks. Good. Jeff, great presentation, especially for a fire geek like me. Um, how does the firefighting efforts affect pattern recognition forest fires? I like that question, Steve. We have to, one of my first things I do, I talk to the local fire department. What did you guys do? Because sometimes in wildfires, I'm glad you asked that, we have to fight fire with fire. Have you seen those guys with the drip torches? And that starts, we have another origin area, and the firefighters did it for a tactical reason. And it will advance, and they're going to burn out fingers or unburn areas. So the first thing, one of the first things I do, talk to the local fire folks, find out what did they do. Because it has messed with my head, because I saw separate ignitions, and it turns out they were running along with drip torches or flares, or they even use helicopters called helitorch. Isn't that cool? Just throwing little gel bombs out of a helicopter? I'd love to do that. Good, good question, Steve. So, I, so I'm interested in the, in, the, in the craft of the investigation. So typically, is there a typical range of amounts of time that you as a fire investigator spend investigating? And I'm sure there are extremes. You go there, you find the max on the first minute of the first day, and then there are probably 16 month investigations. But what is a typical amount of time that you end up on a on a medium, medium complexity fire? Generally three to five days. Uh, interviews take a, a, a lot of time. I'll usually bring someone with me to fly a drone or to knock on doors or get doorbell cameras uh, on that, but on the ground, usually three to five days. And then a couple of weeks to write the report? At least, especially billable hours, right? No. <laughs> Could you expand on the gable walls, the top middle on the top row of the previous slide? Thanks. Talk about gables. Oh, the gables. Okay. Um, gable ends on some homes will have openings for breathability. I know that's a bad word to some of you. No, no, no. No, when he says breathability, he's meaning vented roofs. Okay, no, not, this isn't an Allison Bales thing. <laughs> It's vented roofs, sometimes vented claddings. So okay. anyway, see, we, have, we have to translate. All right, yeah. I apologize. So the, the vented roofs, if there is an opening, you saw the video with the amount of embers. Those embers will find an opening and hit some combustible material. So the design of the roof is important. Joe's got a great paper on well, that. So a, is there a difference between vents located along the eave as opposed to a gable configuration? That, that cut my, my attention I wanted to Well, we don't that. know what direction the fire is coming from. Uh, we don't know how far, how fast the wind is blowing. So it, the design of the roof, I mean, is it always going to be foolproof? Absolutely not. But we need to limit the openings and protect them where we can, especially using non-combustible materials. Carol, I, I can help you. Go. So it, Please. It, it's the design of the venting system. Sometimes it's soffits and ridge. Sometimes it's soffits and gables. And sometimes it's gables and mushroom vents. It's, it's, it's holes in general are a bad idea in roofs. And there are a lot of roofs that don't have gable vents. They're not as risky as those that do have gable vents. Does well, I thought you? that the difference was, was between the gable versus envelope slope configuration. No. Just that's about the vents. Okay. Just that's about the that's vents. It. Thank you. Perfect, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Short of building, of not building near 
woods. Are there any, if you had a wish list, is there anything that can be done to kind of reduce the underlying threat of all of these? You mentioned prescribed burns don't always go as well as intended. Yeah, it's, it's a complete community effort. One is getting the message out to reduce wildfires. 85% are started by wildfires, but it's that balance of defensible space and structural hardening. And it is a personal decision people and communities have to make. Uh, everyone likes the trees in their yard, but a tree within 10 feet of a house, particularly a conifer, therein lies the problem. So I always say, if you want that trophy blue spruce next to your house, count that as part of your house and then make your defensible space go out from that. But it's that balance of de-space and structural hardening. Great presentation. Uh, quick question regarding NFPA 285. I'm assuming you're familiar with the standard. Uh, if you covered it early in your presentation, I'm sorry I missed the beginning, but the NFPA 285 basically allows combustible claddings to be used. And I just value your insight on whether you think that type of standard is stringent or difficult enough to truly prove that a cladding would be, shall we say, fire resistant enough? It, it depends, because I've seen the cladding where there's still openings, you know, and it depends on how tight that construction is. Um, I know 285, but I'm not, you know, well versed in it. Well, and it's, it's, it's a window opening test, so the fire is from within as opposed to being on the outside. Yeah. So it doesn't create the same condition from a spatial separation standpoint. Right, so you already knew the answer to the question. Well, <laughs> oh, it's a trick question. question. It's, no, no, it's, it's, it's called the leading question, and that's not allowed in court, but, oh. it, is allowed, but it is allowed <laughs> here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what I have seen with windows is uh, light curtains, the radiant heat, regardless of the window design, right. it will ignite the light curtains. Heavier curtains are a little more restrictive, but when we're going through uh, ahead of a fire and doing, it's called structural preparation, throwing firewood off decks, but we will rip down curtains if we can get in a home because they will, that the heat will transfer through the windows and, and take the curtains out. Okay, just, so just, I'll just, buy a drink later and we'll talk about 285. Let's do that. Well, yes, I just want to, but I want to support your, your, your question. So I was just being a dickhead to mess with your head. <laughs> That's a first, Joe. No, no, I, I, I wear a necktie. There's another story there. But anyway, the, the problem is that NFPA 285 does with the internal test, but it does limit how high and how wide the fire spreads after it pops through. So Correct. there is some relevance to an exterior fire, but it's, I don't believe it's sufficient. Well, and that's, that's where I, I was going to go. I don't think it's, 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 it's fabulous. I mean, we had um, Jesse Beidel three years ago, yeah. who was the grandfather of NFP 285, who was like magic. He's not as funny as you, and, 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 and clearly older. And, and I'm longer. not as funny as you. No, no, no. no. But, but, so, and Jesse, you know, came up with that test, and he, he also knows that it needs to be expanded, and we haven't we haven't done that. We need to. And so, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan. That's a bad pun of having a very 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 narrow space, so that we try to starve the fire as opposed to, you know, with two, the friction of two layers. And the only people that I remember doing any real tests were you know, Tamura and Shaw in 67, 68 um, in, in, in Canada with apartment buildings. We're not doing that anymore, and we need to. In, in my, okay, I'm going to shut up. You have the last question, sir. Yeah. I, okay, you'll have the last question, too. Yeah, you're, I, I you're the I, second last. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's an answer to this, but when there is a... F so... So, for example, because there's um, no intentional burning and, and there's a drought, so there's a long period of time when there's incredible amount of fuel that, that has built up, right? And so these fires, even when they get out of the woods, um, they can spread through the brushes and get, get to residential buildings. And I know that because my brother's house was burned in the Jesus Sea fighter in 2009 in California. And um, so the question I have is, is there any rule of thumb or understanding about how long after a fire event the fuel can build back up again so the same area is prone to burning again? I, I like that question. Uh, one, climate. We know fuels grow, you know, the flashy or lighter fuels yeah. will regenerate in one to two years. 
whereas large conifers will take, we call them 10,000 hour fuels, but when we get a six inch diameter tree or bigger, that's over a period of five to 10 years. But the problem is, look at the Oakland fires that happened in mid 80s, if you remember that. What did they do? They, the foundations, the slabs were still there. They built the homes right back on the same foundation, planted more trees, didn't bury the power lines, and Oakland is prime for another fire in the same exact spot. Right. And, and I don't mean to pick on California, but they are doing everything wrong by putting the same homes in the same place with the same construction, and they're planting combustible vegetation in the exact same spot. So history is going to repeat itself. We, we, need, we need to build the wall around California. <laughs> I'm not going there, Joe. <laughs> Last great, question. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, what is the value of intumescent coatings? And if we use an intumescent like we use for foam uh, versus combustible siding or non-combustible siding, is intumescent coating enough to to uh, harden non-combustible siding, or does it need to be a combination of non-combustible siding and intumescence if we want to really max out our exterior protection against the fire front? Yeah, I can't answer that question because that's a little out of my wheelhouse. Uh, can someone here jump in? On that? I, I apologize, but I, I'm allowed to have an opinion even though I'm not qualified. Okay. <laughs> Intermescent coatings buy you 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's not enough, in my view. I think we should burn stuff and figure, oh, we are burning stuff. Yes. We should actually pay an attention to what has worked and what hasn't. I, I think there's some merit there, but it would be nice to do some full-scale mm -hmm. burn tests and see, and see what happens. Cool, but, let's I mean, light the big something lesson, on fire. The big, the big lesson for me, I learned, is that wood burns. I didn't know that. Well, I didn't know, that's new. Unbelievable. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you. Whoa, good job. Good job. All right, so we're going to have a 15-minute break, not a 30-minute break, because...